What up, people? Episode 89, Wake and Rake Podcast. Danny Vietti here. Brixie's on assignment. He's doing Red Sox pre and post game most of this week and weekend. Sox just got trounced by Joe Ryan. What an impressive performance that was. So I decided to make an executive decision. If Brooksy's not going to be here, why don't we start making some calls and, and make some trades? So temporarily, of course, um, we're going to trade Brooksy this week, this week only, uh, for another color commentator, another analyst, and another pre and post game guy. How about a Mark Gubiza? Uh, Paul, he's Sports West. He's been there for nearly two decades now. Uh, he's now their color analyst for the Angels over on Bally Sports West. And he spent 14 seasons at the big league level to winning a World Series in 1985. 13 of those 14 seasons came with the Kansas City Royals. Uh, played with guys like George Brett. Was in the same rotation as Brett Saberhagen. He's also a two-time All-Star and just all-around good dude. Uh, Kansas City Royals Hall of Famer. So Gooby's going to be stopping by and uh, sharing his story, sharing his knowledge with us on today's show. So looking forward to that. Um, by the way, he's gotten the luxury of being able to spend nearly every single day these last few years. Since he is the color commentator for the Angels, uh, he's gotten to know Mike Trout, Shohei Otani. And he's gotten to see those guys uh, on a day-to-day basis for the last five years so just picking his brain we're gonna talk about his career uh he was actually roommates with george brett and brett saberhagen got to imagine there were some pretty good ragers going on there in the uh in in the saberhagen uh, george brett uh gooby household so that should be fun to discuss um and we'll also just discuss otani's future is what can gooby tell us about otani's impending for agency uh, could this be the last year that Otani dons the Los Angeles Angel Red? We'll pick his brain on that. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wagers, including live betting and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your phone. Head to the website. Or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use promo code BELIEVE for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get to Gooby. Mark Gubiza, right here on the Wake and Rake podcast. Mark Gubiza, joining the Wake and Rake podcast from the Mile High City. How's the uh, Colorado air treating you? How's the season going? Angels commentator, 14 years in the big, two-time All-Star and World Series champion joining the show. Hey, uh, you know, it's just fun. I'll tell you what, I love it up here in Denver. I haven't been here in, in quite a while. I think the last time I was up here, the Angels were playing the Rockies, and I remember it's one of the first times Shoei was ever taking batting practice outside, and he hit one a couple over the bullpen mount, mounds in, in right center into the third deck. And I remember just looking and going, wow, this kid's unbelievable. Fast, fast forward to what we're seeing right now, like uh, he's beyond anything I thought back even then. So, you know, I love it up here in Denver. Uh, glad that, glad to be here. Tough little series against the Dodgers. You know, they, they pitched well, the Angels. The Dodgers pitched a little bit better. I mean, especially one of those games where you face six, seven relievers. I would not want to be a hitter because you really can't time anybody because everyone's coming in with a different arm angle. Righty, lefty, some throwing harder, throw, some throwing more breaking balls. So yesterday's game especially was pretty tough. Did you ever try that out? I mean, you played 14 seasons in the bigs early on in your career. You were low to mid nines, which was for, for that era was was top echelon. Uh, did you ever try out different arm slots to try and mess up timing? Yeah, I mean, because I, I used to watch my uh, my old teammate David Cohn was really good with that. I mean, he would do you know hesitation in his delivery. He go he called Laredo dropping his arm down to a sidearm. I tried that, but. The way my arm actually was a little bit different than anybody else's anyhow, because I had that little bit of hook in the back, like, you know, Terry Mulholland and even Rick Sutcliffe. So it wasn't easy for me to try, try different arm angles, but, you know, watching Coney all those times, I tried it, but uh, yeah, it was fun. I, I just love competing. I didn't care if it was, you know, Albert Bell at the plate or Don Manningly. I mean, whoever, even if they had a success against me, a, a Dave Winfield, a Kirby Puckett, it was just fun going against those guys. So I mentioned to you before we started that Middlebrooks was not able to join us. He's actually doing the uh, similar to your job. He's doing pre and post game right now for the Red Sox right now. But 
he wanted me to send along a message to you. So let me know if you can hear this audio in about two seconds here. All right. Best hair in the league, best teeth in the league, and wait until you see the tan on this guy. My goodness. He is golden. Golden. It's like Dennis Eckersley. All the guys from that era have just like the perfect tans, but now they do TV. It's funny. Good guy, though. You're going to enjoy him. <laughs> that was straight from really Brooksy. Right. Oh, that was, he's awesome, man. It was great when I got a chance to talk to him a couple times, obviously, when we played the Red Sox. Uh, it was easy. Yeah, I, I guess it is that era. I mean, anytime you're in the same conversation as Dennis Eckersley, the Eck, you know, I mean, I got to play with him one time in the All-Star game in 88 in Cincinnati, and I'll never forget to ask him, I said, Eck, are you ever nervous, you know, on the mound? Because he looked like he was so calm. And, I mean, he, I love the way he fist pumped after he got that third out. He goes, the biggest thing was he had a fear of failure. And I looked at him, I go, what? Because I thought, like, he felt that he owned every hitter he ever faced. He goes, no, I was always afraid to fail, that it drove me to be the best player I could possibly be. And, and from that point forward, it, may, it really hit me that, yeah, that's, that's a good way to go about it. You never want to think a negative, but you also want to think, okay, I don't want to fail because I got a lot of teammates, I got a lot of fans, I got an organization that are counting on me. And I think that does push you to another level. That and the fact that I can get a 10 just like him, it's a good thing. Yeah, it was like a starter pack for Orange County, right? Like you have to spend 20 bucks on avocado toast, $15 on a juice, uh, and you have to drive a Tesla. Like that's the bare minimum for living in Orange County. Oh, if you only knew me that much better than that. You know, I, I'm like my kids always give me a grief. I'm the world's worst eater. But you give me a soft pretzel, a slice of pizza, and maybe a burger, a turkey burger, I'll go that far anyhow. But that's about the extent of my eating palate, that's for sure. You're a Philly guy at heart, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The chicken cheesesteak or a Philly cheesesteak, either one, I'm all good. We'll get into food. We have a little bit of a rapid fire at the end. So, uh, yeah, we'll okay. get into some food debates at the end for sure. Um, let's kick it back to your playing days here. So yep. when you first got the uh, opening or I should say opening day roster spot, you, Brett Saberhagen and George Brett, from what I was reading, you guys were all roommates. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. It was cool. So just before we made the team, Sabes and I, because at that point, the manager, we see these these things on social media and Twitter and stuff where the manager brings a guy in and tells me to get called up, which is I, which I love. But at that point, if you got called into the office, that means you were getting sent down. So Sabes and I were like, we're bringing our suitcases in and we're like, what do we do here? So we kind of snuck it in where the bus was going from, you know, Fort Myers to, we were going to go to Memphis, Tennessee to play an exhibition game and on the way to Kansas City. So we remember... We, we, we snuck our suitcases in the pile of the other guy's suitcases. Like, wow, they'll never know we're here. So then we snuck on the bus and like hid back in the seat, never said a word. And then all of a sudden the bus takes off. We're like, wow, we might be able to sneak on and be part of this team. And, and lo and behold, we get to Memphis. And then George Brett comes up. He goes, hey, hey, kids, you're staying with me. And I went, oh, my God. So I remember the first chance I could, finally we go to George's house. I'm walking into his house. I go, Mr. Brett, can I use your phone? And he goes, you can use my phone anytime you want, but please don't call me Mr. Brett. So I called home. I said, told my dad, I go, dad, I made the big legs and I'm staying with George Brett. Can you believe this? He goes, son, don't, you're living a dream. Please don't ever wake up. And I said, you know what? I think I'm still in this dream world right now, but that was the coolest thing. George Brett saying, hey, Saves, you guys stay with me. I'm like, wow. And then he eventually found us a condominium down in the country called Plaza Forest too. And then Saves got married that year, and then I came back the next year after my rookie year, and I stayed with him again the first couple of weeks before he found a condo for me down away, not too far from where I was the year before. So George Brett was just as good of a, uh, a real estate agent as he was a player then, apparently. Yeah, he had the connections. He had the connections. George Brett, you know, has like he could run for mayor there, and he won in a landslide. But you know, that's the thing about George: it's competitive and as great as a player he was. Everybody wanted to be his buddy. And then for him to embrace two kids, you know, I'm 21 and saved his 20 and bring us in there, make us feel comfortable. And, and, and knowing that and he told us, told me later on, he goes, I knew if, if we were ever going to get back and had a chance to win anything in baseball, I needed you kids to be able to be able to develop into the players you should be. And they said, and I feel pretty good about being part of that you know, process to get you guys there. Safe to say he got the master bedroom. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I would have slept. I would have slept in the basement on the floor. I mean, I was no different than my row home back in Philly, where we had like an eleven hundred square foot home, where <laughs> four boys and my mom and dad and sharing one bathroom. So I didn't care where it was, as long as we had a roof on. Are you the youngest of four? Yeah, 
Yeah, I have three older brothers. Likewise. Yeah, so that means, you know, that you know how that goes too. So you get you're the you know, you get the hand me down clothes. And I got a brother that's about five foot eight, and here I am six foot five. So you can imagine wearing pants from a guy that's uh, slightly shorter than you and what I look like walking around the, the city of Philadelphia. Gooby, what if I told you that I am the youngest of four boys? I am six foot six. I was a pitcher, um, and I also have a struggle finding jean sizes. Yeah, oh, I know that feeling. I'm like, if I ever get any jeans that ever fit, you know, I was going to go, oh, that's pretty cool. Then and finding the you know, shoe size, I swear, I couldn't, you know, at that point, I have a size 12, and I guarantee I was a 13 or 14, but you couldn't find that. So I just jammed my feet in there. My toes are still the ugliest things, by the way. I won't, I won't ever <laughs> show them anywhere around. That's why I wear sneakers everywhere I go. They're the ugliest feet in the world. Wait, so you're going down to Huntington Beach. You're wearing sneakers? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I'm always going to be walking around. I say, oh, this is pretty cool walking on the beach. My wife goes, well, why don't you just feel the sand on the beach? I said, no, I'm good. If I take my shoes off, I'm, I'm digging it in the sand as quick as possible because they are not pretty, those feet. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> we both share August birthdays, too. So I love where this is going. August birthdays, six, go. six, and we can't find jean sizes. We're both just distraught <laughs> people at this point. Uh, yeah. Okay. What, what was it like playing with Bo Jackson? Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, you know, to this day, I always, you know, the things he did. I mean, I watched Shohei Otani. We'll probably talk about him in a little bit. Yeah. But Bo was unbelievable. How strong he was, how fast he was, uh, the, you know, the arm strength he had. I mean, everyone saw that throw he threw out Hal Reynolds out at the plate. I remember being in that dugout today, that day, watching that hit to left field. And I literally, in, in the old kingdom, the, the dugout, was right and connected with the clubhouse. So I started making my way to the clubhouse and I gave a courtesy look back and I'm looking up, I'm like, oh my, that baseball was going all the way in the air. And Booney's like, I think Bob Boone, who was catching that at that time, was completely shocked himself that his throw came all the way from the warning track in the air and throws out Harold Reynolds to save the game. Steve Farr was on the mound that day. He started walking off to himself. Then he just looked over and goes, I can't believe that play happened. So I remember the first home run he hit. I remember him hitting a home run off of, Oil can boy to Fenway Park going way over where the, the, the flag is there in left center field, way over that wall, you know, under the street. And then the very next year, I mean, I remember Oil can goes, man, Bo, you're never going to get me again. Face him in spring training, hits the ball again about 5,000 miles, and I had to go retrieve that baseball beyond there in, in Haines City, Baseball City in Florida. So did stuff that nobody ever did on the baseball field. And then he was fortunate. You know, I was cool enough to – he gave me sideline pass to every one of the Raider games. So I was on the sidelines with Magic Johnson and all those guys watching Bo and his teammates during football games, I kid you not, would come over and they go, this guy is just not real. And I go, well, check him out on the baseball field. I know exactly the same feeling because he, he's just running over football players, flying by guys like they're not even there. Uh, he was just not a normal human being. We call Shoei the unicorn. Bo, we just said that he was dropped from another planet and he just came down and just graced us with his presence. How was he able to balance practice, spring training, NFL, you know, training camps to NFL games? Like, uh, obviously, he was well liked by his teammates, so there wasn't a question of work ethic, but how was he able to balance two professional sports and not just two professional sports, but an all star level on both? I, I think the biggest thing is people say, he couldn't do it and that's the one thing he always told me he goes when people say i can't do something it motivates me to do it even more so and football even though uh, you know the hardest thing for me when i used to walk in the in the clubhouse with him after games and stuff how the, his teammates respected him and liked him because he missed all those you know those two a days of summer camps where you just get beat up before the season starts so here he is coming in halfway through the season he's replacing one of the all-time great running backs in marcus allen and yet his teammates all liked him because they respected how hard he worked and how much he put into being absolutely the best player on the football field, just like he did on the baseball field. Yeah, that's incredible. And you've been lucky enough to not only watch Bo Jackson, George Brett, Brett Saberhagen, but now we're here in the 2020s here. And you've gotten the uh, you've been fortunate to be able to watch Mike Trout and Shohei Otani in person every single day for the past few years as the color commentator with Bali Sports West now. Uh, just could you talk about that for a little bit? Being able to see those two guys, two of the best players of this generation, if not the two best players of this generation, on a day to day basis. Yeah, it's funny. That first, I'll, I'll start with Mike Trout. Everyone asks, "What do you think of Trout?" And Trout and I, you know, we we go to Eagle games. We always talk Philly stuff and just have fun with that. 
but you know, everyone always asks to describe my trout. And, and the best way I could do that is basically seeing somebody or playing with somebody that, you know, in my era. So I said, my trout was a combination for me of George Brett, baseball player, Bo Jackson, athlete, wow factor. You put them both together and that was Mike Trout for me. And it's, and it's still to this day is Mike Trout. Yet he still walks around, even on the plane last night, he's joking around. We're, you know, we're having a golf pool coming up and he's just, and that's why they call him the kid. He acts just like a kid and, and he hasn't changed at all. Even though he's on his way to Cooperstown, uh, arguably one of the greatest players the game has ever seen. But uh, he, like Bo he, and George, when somebody says he can't do something, well, he can't hit a high fastball. He made that adjustment. He, he doesn't play center field as good as we think he should. He goes out and has one of his best defensive metric seasons, you know, last year. All those things, when anybody motivates him, he's even better. And uh, I'll tell you what, there's there's really, when you see you put all his skill set together, there's really hard to beat anybody, especially from the first day. I mean, it's the first day he came on to the major league level that uh, the expectations, the comparisons, the Mickey Mantle, because they look alike, you know, then the Willie Mays, Joe DiMaggio, all those numbers he started with and have that kind of pressure on him all the way through, yet he's the same dude every day. I mean, and yet he still wants to be better. He's still trying to prove he's out early hitting, batting practice, hitting off machines, throwing break of balls, high velocity fastballs. It's it's amazing watching him work every single day. Yeah, Middlebrooks tells me all the time because they played Arizona Fall League together, and he said he is the most normal dude you will ever meet. He wants to go home. He wants to hit some baseballs head home, play some Madden. This was before he had kids, of course. Go home, play some Madden, and then go back the next day, hit some more baseballs and play yeah. some more Madden. Like, that's just who Trout is. Yeah, that's why I think his teammates just love love being around. I mean, everybody that ever comes ends up being a teammate of his, past or present, is still, they always want to talk to him. I watched last night Mookie Betts and him, they exchanged uniform jerseys. They played together for Team USA. They created that bond right away. And Mookie Betts is one of the best players in the game himself. Yet Trout has that kind of a uh, – persona about him where everyone wants to be his teammate just because like you said he's a normal dude i mean he does he'll go play golf with you he'll go fishing with you we had a flight where we flew into baltimore kind of early we landed there and he's not too far there in his house in jersey where he took hunter renfro they went fishing on, on a lake by his house and boom he's sending me some pictures of the fish they caught i'm like of course the fish probably just jumped on the hook when it comes to trouty and stuff so i think like, it's the kind of guy he is everyone just likes being around him What's the deal with the media constantly critiquing Trouty about not being marketable? Yeah, that's the thing. I don't I don't understand that. If you're around him, see, we do this all the time. When he walks up to the on deck circle, he signs a bunch of autographs. Before the game, he's doing the same thing. I remember when the commissioner said that about Trouty, and I said, all you gotta do is watch one of our games before the game starts, what he does. He is Cal Ripken Jr., I thought, was the same way. The interaction with the fans. The fans love him. He's all about baseball. He wants to play. Derek Jeter was the same way. He just wanted to yeah. play. I think if baseball was smart enough on this thing, you mark it the way the fans react to him and how he reacts to the fans. I always go, Trotty, how do you do this? You're signing a kid's autograph. You're in the all deck circle. You're facing Justin Verlander. Two seconds later, throwing 98. How do you focus? He goes, because I love going out there facing Justin Berlin and, and the best in the best. And I said, you were not distracted by the fan. He goes, no, it helped me relax to go to the batter's box. I'm like, that's why he's my trout. That's such a great point though. Like how can you possibly say in the same argument that Derek Jeter is marketable, but Mike Trout's not Derek, Have you ever heard Derek Jeter in a press conference, the most dry political answer you'll ever hear. And I get that he played for the Yankees and trout plays out in LA West coast time, Pacific time. But they're the same guy in the press conferences, except yep. you can make the argument that Trout is more of an electrifying player. So that, that's a great point. Yeah, I mean, and then Trout idolized Derek Jeter. So when those two got a chance to play in the All-Star game, I mean, it was it was great for him, both of them, really, when you think about it. But they're all about their teammates. They're all about winning. And they're not about, you know, promoting themselves. They're promoting the team, the game, and and, and, and the love they have for the sport. So Trout's normal ish let's yeah. talk about someone yeah. who is not normal by any stretch of the imagination Shohei Otani uh <laughs> have you ever seen you you talked about Bo Jackson how he's maybe the closest you've ever seen to something this spectacular can you think of anything else that's this dominant this rare in any sport no I mean I always joke around it's like Tom Brady 
you know, being a quarterback and dominating on the quarterback and then going, oh, okay, I'll go play linebacker and lead the league in interceptions and sacks. I mean, that wasn't going to happen. I mean, but Shohei, I, I don't think people understand how hard it is as a pitcher, say, like he did last night, he strikes out 12 guys. First, I mean, most everybody an angel against a Dodger team. And then you would be playing, normally would be playing today, and he'd be out there facing somebody throwing 100 miles an hour, and he hit the ball 450 feet. Most pitchers can't even walk the day after they pitch. Every part of their body sore. And go back to David Cohn. We talked about this the other day. We were in New York. He said, we were happy to get out of bed. We were happy to be able to, you know, run foul pole to foul poles and maybe play some long toss. He's going out there and competing the very next day against the very best players. He's playing every day. There's not many guys that play every day as it is, let alone pitch every six days. And in the, in the full max effort, he throws the baseball. You know, it's unreal. We were in a series down in Texas. He hits four home runs the other way. One went 116.1 miles per hour exit velocity. The other way going 459. That's the hardest uh, opposite field home run hit in the stack cast era. All these things we're saying, the best, you know, anybody's ever done. He was the fastest going down the first base on average, home the first last year in the game. And this guy's pitching and he's hitting and he's playing every day. So, but his work ethic, I mean, you know, we all, everyone asks, what, what, what's your hobby? He goes, sleeping. You know, he sleeps and eats and works out baseball. That's all he does right now. And his, his focus is, is like nothing I've ever seen. And I, like I said, I mentioned, I played with a lot of great players, Hall of Famers, and I've seen a lot of great players, but I've never seen anybody with a focus and a determination and, and respect for our great game than, than Shohei Otani. Could you imagine Bo Jackson's stat cast numbers if they had stat cast back in the 70s, 80s, 90s? No, that would have been unbelievable because I still i am convinced that first home run he hit off of Mike Moore, they said, went 475. This is before they put the water fountains in in, uh, in left center field, so it was a grassy knoll going up there. That ball, we were thinking it's going to leave the entire stadium. It went up to the top of the, the grassy knoll and, and stuck there. It wasn't like it, it fell it trickled down. So that ball probably still had some distance going. It just stuck in there like we all wish we could do when we hit a drive and it goes down the fairway and gets in there and stays in the fairway instead of rolling into the rough. That ball was at least 500-plus feet, but uh, – I don't think it can measure as much as well, but Statcast would have probably had that, like a Joe Adele home run the other day down in Salt Lake at about five, five fourteen. That was ridiculous. Yeah, that was not. That kid's got some pop. That guy can just cut yeah. down his strikeout numbers, and make contact on a regular basis. He's going to be a real player. I, I agree totally on that one. Um, you were constantly intertwined with Chili Davis in the trade rumor mill. Uh, you're yeah. three to three or four different times in your career. Otani's been among trade rumors this year with his impending free agency after this season. Have you had any conversations with him about how to handle those talks? Yeah, you know, I've been fortunate enough from the from the first day he came into camp. I, I have no rhyme or reason why this came about, but the first interview he was going to do, he wanted me to do it. And I was like, wow, that's that was an honor. So we've done that every year since he, he came over to the States in MLB baseball. So every year we talk about things. And Ipe and I, we I send text messages like that, just to just to give them little nuggets here and there. Just what I try to do, prepare physically and mentally on the mound myself. But as far as you know, the free agent stuff, it's one of those things where he immediately, if you say anything to him, they'll go, uh, "I'm just, I just trying to win." Even if ever anybody asks, "Are you tired? Do you need a day off?" He goes, "Nope, I just want to win." Uh, there's there's something about him and, and his focus about not getting involved in those conversations. You, you mentioned Shelly Davis. We we won the World Series in 1985. We just come back from the White House, meeting President Reagan. And all of a sudden, I look up. I see I'm, I'm by myself. I'm looking up on TV. I've been traded to San Francisco for Chili Davis. Like, boom, we just got back from the White House. I'm like, what? So now I call John Sherholtz, who was our general manager at that point. I go, Mr. Sherholtz, is, is this true? He goes, first of all, if you hear your name in rumors, that means you're not being traded. And I'll never forget that because it's funny because all those years I was always rumored and there was all kinds of stuff written. You're going here, you're going there. It's when you're not hearing your name anywhere, that's when the trade comes about. So as much as we all love in this world, we're all at right now, we want to have to be the first to know where Shoei may be going and this and that at free agent market. That's, you know, I, there's nothing going to happen with Shoei Otani this season. And I think and the more I see him right now is – his teammates and the way he loves his teammates, you know, Patrick Sandoval, him and Patrick are so close. 
Zach Neto and Mickey Moniak just came out recently saying he's the best friend, best teammate they've ever had. And he likes being around this guy, these guys right now. And, and his respect he has for Mike Trout. If they continue to play good baseball, it would not surprise me if you see Shohei wearing an angel uniform for the rest of his career. We'll start to turn things up a little bit because I know you have a lot of things to do. But uh, one final question about the current Angels. Is this the year that the drought finally ends? Yeah, I mean, they're running through a tough stretch now because they have some key guys out. And that's going to be difficult to come back. Rendon will be back before too long. Gio Urshela was so good. He probably won't be back the rest of the season. Uh, Logan Ohapi is going to be back. I'll tell you what, he would have been in the conversation for Rookie of the Year. And Zach Neto will be back at some time real soon. So once they get all those pieces together, this is as deep as team as I've seen. They figured out some stuff in the bullpen. They brought guys up from Double A, bringing some gas at 98 to 100 miles an hour. Ben Joyce looks like he'll be back throwing 103. Their bullpen's better. Their starters are figuring it out right now, and that's the important thing. You know, Reed Detmers has figured some things out. He's back to where he was last year. Shoei, Shoei, Patrick Sandoval's throwing well. Griffin Canning has been great. You know, Tyler Anderson's still trying to figure out some things. And, you know, but I think the last time out, he threw the ball much better. And Jaime Berea has been really good. So I, I think this is the year they do that. They were they had a playoff spot this two days ago. They're about a half a game out. Uh, there's a lot of game left. The American League is tough. I mean, if you were in the National League right now, you feel pretty good about it because there's teams that are up and down. But uh, the American League is going to be tough. The AL East is extremely tough. The AL West is extremely tough. Seattle hasn't even started playing good baseball yet, too, and I think they will. So it's going to be a battle, but I think it's the year they get to the postseason. They were my uh, the Angels were my preseason World Series prediction, and people laughed at me. We'll see what happens. Hey, hey can you imagine having Shohei Otani in Game One, Four, and Seven? That you feel pretty good. <laughs> please for the baseball yeah. God, please do it. Y- yes, yes. Hey, look out for those Oakland A's too. <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. Um, rapid. Yeah. <laughs> let's go. Let's go rapid fire. All, All right. right, you got it. You got it. Which would you rather have, a Philly cheesesteak, Kansas City barbecue, or In and Out Burger? Oh, Philly cheesesteak. Okay, like five times in one day. How's that? Definitely. Funny, fun, funniest teammate you've ever had. Uh, you know. It, I think Jeff Montgomery was because he, he nobody everyone always thought he was so serious. He was and David Howard was pretty funny too. But Jeff Montgomery, this this his mannerisms and everything he did, the way we could joke with him, Jeff Montgomery. Favorite player to watch right now, not named Shohei Otani or Mike Trout. Uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. I love that guy. I got you know he brings an energy to a field. Tatis Jr. I do I like a lot too, and Mookie Betts too, but. I think Acuna is junior is like ridiculously good. One teammate you absolutely would not ask to babysit your kids. <laughs> oh, how many, how many can I say at once? No, they're all, they were all pretty cool. I, oh man, that's a, that's a tough one. The entire 1985 Kansas city Royals <laughs> roster. Yes, especially after the parade and on the way to the white house <laughs> and that plane. I don't think I let anybody watch my kids on that plane. Fair enough. Which do you prefer, the Anaheim Angels, California Angels, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, or the Los Angeles Angels? You know what? I'm going to say Angels, the Angels. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. I, it's easy to, easy to say. And, you know, I, I played against the California Angels. I, I wore an Anaheim Angels uniform when they when Dizzy owned it. So I, I just like the Angels. Like, by the way, I love their City Connect unis. I think they're yeah. the best in the game. They are super, super cool. I've been begging for one of those uniform tops now for three years, and I can't get one. But I'm going to get one at some point. I do have a hoodie, uh, you know, the City Connect hoodie, but I, I need a uniform top at some point. Yeah, I saw you got to meet Justin Herbert when you were doing the City Connect promo too. That was oh pretty- yeah. Dude, and my my thumb, I think, still hurts. Every pass he threw was perfect. We kept drilling me in my thumb. I'm like, and I had it, you know, I kept thinking I got to make a perfect pass because I know the one I throw like horribly. That'll be the one they'll show on the commercial. So yeah, it was. It was incredible. That dude is gigantic, too, and what a cool dude he is. Who was taller? You had to have been, like, a couple inches, No, right? No, he was posting me up, man. I couldn't believe it, man. He's, wow. like, six, 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 seven range. I mean, and I'm thinking, man, how do you ever tackle him on the football field? But, you know, those other guys are just as big and just as fast and, and weigh a few more pounds. So, But he was a super cool dude. You know, I'm a Eagle fan all the way through, but after meeting him, I'm always pulling for the Chargers, too. Two final ones for you. Who's the most underrated player on the Los Angeles Angels right now? 
Hmm. Uh, let's see. The most underrated player right now, Brandon Drury. He's been great. I mean, he's. I mean, I think he right now the way he's hitting the baseball, and he's played a really good second base too. I think he's he's an all star. So Brandon Drury would be that guy. Final one. Uh, if you could have dinner with any one person, they could be alive or not. Who would you choose? Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin. Nice. Got to. You were a hair. You were a hair band guy, weren't you? Yeah, but you know, but Led Zeppelin. I mean, again, that's the one way, one time I might call in sick for a baseball game <laughs> if Led Zeppelin ever goes back on tour again. I'm like, I'm sorry, I I have a little bit of a stomach ache, and you'll see me just jumping on the stage and hanging out with the boys from Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I love it. Hey, Gibby, we can't thank you enough for joining us. Um, keep doing great stuff for Bully Sports West. I love watching you. Um, hopefully the Angels do get into the postseason this year and we can see more of Trout, Shohei. Please tell Mike Stefanik that Danny Vietti says hello. We played college ball together, and it's fun for me to see him on this stage. Oh, he's a good dude. I just joke around when I'm on the plane. He's always like, yes, sir, and all this. Like, dude, um, I, I feel like I'm still like one of the guys at any time you're like, yes, sir, you feel like you're 150 years old. But I'll definitely tell him that. I'll definitely. He's a great kid. I'm I'm glad of what he did last year. And then, obviously, the, the great stretch he was at AAA to have him back in the big leagues, it's pretty cool. Just tell him, ask him who won the GSAC conference in 2018. That'll get him going. He might he, That might rattle him a little bit because it, <laughs> I'll tell you this. It was not Westmont College, which is who he was playing for in 2018. I'll just leave it at that. Oh, I will do that one. I'll get him going there for sure. <laughs> There you go. Give hey, me, Joe hey. Brooksy, I said, hey, man, you know, <clears throat> he's got the great teeth and everything else going himself. So I'm just trying to be him. <laughs> I'll let him know. Gooby, thank you so much, man. I can't thank you enough. Appreciate that. Have a good one. What a guy, Gooby. I mean, can't thank him enough for joining the Wake and Ray podcast. It's just a walking baseball encyclopedia. Like the guys that he played with, played against, roomed with. Uh, so thank you again to Mark Gubita for joining the show today um middlebrooks is going to be back on the next episode likely going to have a power ranking episode coming out on monday thank you guys so much for tuning in another edition of the wake and rake podcast all part of the believe network we'll talk soon people peace